Hello and welcome to the recap of today's CodeBuddies.org live coding session. CodeBuddies is a global community of amazing people who help each other become better at software development through conversations on Slack and peer-to-peer -peer organized study groups and virtual hangouts. In today's session, we've continued working on the Western Friend website. We're working on the Deep Archive, which takes issues of Western Friends predecessor publication called Friends Bulletin, uh, dating back to 1929 and renders them in the Western Friend website in a way that the user can browse online, go to the Internet Archive to view the, the full document and including, I think, having it read aloud and doing full text search and things like that. But we at least render the PDF in line. Uh, today, I worked on a couple of relatively small features. One is this filter by year, we, again, the archive goes back to 1929, so we want to allow people to select a particular year of interest and view just the issues for that, as well as, um, which it creates a query string parameter, and we'll dig more into the code here, as well as just being able to view them all, clear that search off for there, uh, which removes the query string parameter. Query string property, I don't know, anyway. The other thing we added, is a quick menu to get to the magazine issues, archive issues, and then manage the metadata uh, for how the magazine is organized. And that is called departments, magazine departments, like, um, well, you could have a family department or just various kind of categories of how you organize the magazine content. And uh, when we're viewing the archive issues, we just see a table here with the title and the publication date. I'll show you again how this is generated in the Wagtail code. So without further ado, let's go ahead and view the pull request and we might hop back here to the um, rendered view occasionally. So on our pull request, we're gonna just look at the files from top to bottom, not necessarily in the order they were created. What we added today on the, WAG, uh, the deep archive page is a um, bootstrap card containing a form which has one main form element. The name and the ID both reflect how sort of Django lets you filter or specify a field. Uh, this is the field name publication date and this double underscore means to get the year component. This is a date time field, if I recall correctly. This is a date field, I guess we didn't collect the time. I'm um, using it both for the name and the publication, uh, sorry, the ID, the element ID for consistency. The name is used to populate the query string, which is also sent to the server in the request dictionary. The ID is used in our JavaScript, you'll see in just a moment, to toggle the visibility uh, to get the value, um, I'll show you in a moment, to essentially gets the value out of the query string and make sure that the value is selected uh, in the drop down to match the query string for usability, make it simple and obvious. Uh, so the form has a submit button, nothing really out of the ordinary there, just a bootstrap button um, with some alignment and pad margins. Uh, then we have another button that appears next to the search button or the go button that allows you to clear the search results. Um, it's attached to a small JavaScript function we'll look at below, and it's initially invisible. So let's really quick show the front end because that might have not have been obvious. When you first render the page, just at the root, uh, there's no, there's just the search button. So I will choose a year and click go. Then the clear search button appears, the query string has this publication date, uh, and the page element in this case would uh, you know, match the um, publication date because it uh, is what I just selected. But if I, for example, say, sent that link to a friend in the email and said, hey, check out these issues for 1929, we want that to be, uh, um, to reflect those to be um, matching up. It's not necessarily reactive or, or there's no two-way data binding or anything sort of elaborate like that. It's just on uh, page load. So let's go ahead and take a look at the JavaScript and how that happens. I've be really been trying to just keep JavaScript simple and to a minimum in this project. 
We don't want a whole server, single page app framework or anything like that. So keep it simple. So the clear search function is just one line, uh, just replaces the window location with the path. So it essentially strips off the query string, which I think is just uh, the equivalent of refresh, you know, also refreshes the page in the process somehow. I'm not sure exactly how the browser works underneath of it, but didn't need much code to get that to work. So when you click the clear button, takes off the query string and page re reloads. Now, when first rendering the page, we want to check for a query string. And if one exists, uh, we want to show a button that lets you clear it out. Um, that way people, you know, when you've made a selection here, if you just want to say, well, I actually want to see everything, you know, without a button to do that, you'd have to kind of hack the URL or somehow go back to uh, hit re refresh wouldn't work. You know, it's just not obvious. So we want to give a button uh, that allows people to do that. So that's all we're doing is just the buttons there the whole time. But now we're just toggling a class, making it invisible or making it visible, toggling the invisible class, which was already on by default. Uh, then we're getting those search parameters, and for each of them, we're going to get an element. So again, um, the ID of the element matches the the search parameter, and the name of the element also matches the search parameter because the name is what creates the search parameter. And so we're just kind of keeping things consistent um, and setting the value of that to the value to match the value. So. By keeping things consistent, I don't have as much moving parts, as much code needed. So the value here, 1929, you can also see is just, you know, the value more or less of each of these options. But it's not actually literally a value there. It's just the text is treated as the value. All right. Oh, that's it. And then in the case where somebody might have added an arbitrary uh, query string, parameter, we just say, well, we couldn't find that, you know, not a big deal. So yeah, that's it. This JavaScript we wrote earlier. So let's go ahead and take a look at changes to the data model. Now, a couple of things we did for consistency. Previously, I was relying on an internal date. Wagtail page models have a first published on date. And I think there's a little bit of ambiguity there because Wagtail is itself designed as a content management system. So it's handling publication and drafting and other things for content. So it's internal publication um, fields refer to the date the actual content was created in the database. And uh, I was using that field, but then I realized I can separate that and actually I was being inconsistent by using the Wagtail internal field for this um, archive issue, whereas with issues, uh, magazine issues, we actually had to find, sorry, I'm scrolling way up here, but uh, a publication date field and weren't using the internal Wagtail one. So the archive issue and the issue should be consistent if possible. So that's all we did here is just add the publication date as a date time field. And that allows us to say this print copy was published in 1929. But at, um, the representation in Wagtail was published in 2020 or something like that. Keep those separate. They're, they have different meanings. So yeah, that's an improvement. Uh, so we added help text there. Uh, then we have this field, and even the editor, Western, uh, Mary Klein, <laughs> is not exactly sure what we're using this field for. And so I just made it optional. Uh, we may end up deprecating it. It's something probably we put in years, a couple of years ago or something and didn't really use and can't remember why on the Drupal side of things we put that there but moving the con the content in the data model over from Drupal to Wagtail I want to kind of make sure I have at least the basic fields in place that we had previously um, this is probably just a lint related thing I don't think I made any changes here uh, here added a new field panel to display the publication date with the date picker widget that's all. And then I was noticing the archive issues were letting me put pages underneath of them. And really that should be the, the leaf node in the uh, Wagtail page tree. There shouldn't be anything underneath an archive issue. Uh, the table of contents is already part of that. All right. Now here I did some refactoring with the help of some people in the live uh, coding chat. But essentially, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. 
when we render the archive index, we're going to populate it with archive issues that have been filtered in some cases or not and paginated. In this case, I only have three issues. And I had written code like this in um, the memorials section of the website. And I've also written similar code uh, in the magazine section of the website. And I'm realizing, you know, the, as you start to write code over and over, you start to see a pattern. And that pattern is um, filter paginate, essentially two steps. So where I was writing these monolithic get context functions uh, that were doing a bunch of stuff, I realized I could refactor those and it was suggested in the chat that I probably start figuring out how I can unit test some of the code to for make sure things are working properly. So that's what I did here. The context really just, it gets the context from the, from the parent uh, class and then grabs, it filters the archive issues by HTTP request and we'll look inside of each of these functions in a moment and paginates them and attaches that to the page, the context there. I probably could have just, anyway, done this equals that. But in any case, um, the other thing that I attach to the page context is the publication years. So let's take a look at how those functions are written from top to bottom. So for the publication years, we just grab all the archive issues and get the dates for the publication date field and grab the year component for each of those dates. Django, being a mature framework, gives you helpers like this where you can do pretty <laughs> elaborate things just with one line of code. You could probably do it with SQL with a little bit of effort, but yeah, so that was it. And Then I just, it was actually returning, this is a list of, it's like a query set so it's a list of pages it's a set of pages and i just or i think or is no these are it's this list of date times i can't remember exactly let's see yeah it's a list of date times um which have uh, you know i'm only interested in the year component but they come back as python date times anyway um, so i just did a list comprehension here for each of those to grab the year so I literally just get a list of years. That's all I'm after. So it did take a couple of lines. Okay. And again, that's what comes over here. So I just needed that list of um, years so I could iterate over it and put it into a selected element. All right. So now comes the filter part where we take the request in and we see if there's a filter string and a query string in there. If that query string has a publication date, double underscore year, we will use a case insensitive contain and check for that field um, and get the value of the key. So the value is whatever is passed in here. I click go, so it gets the value there. This is code I've reused from another um, section. of The code again, the memorial minutes at the beginning of the live coding session, I actually did several other things we're not going to look at here, uh, mainly low hanging fruit stuff, but one of which was to make the um, memorial search case insensitive when I'm working locally with SQLite. Uh, I know I'm, um, it's not doing case sensitive searching, but when I deploy it and use a Postgres database, it's using case sensitive searching. So the lesson there is uh, widely known, but use the Try to use the same environment and same database locally in your development environment as you do in production. For simplicity, I've just been sticking with SQLite, uh, but this is a case where it came back to bite me and we had a bug we discovered. It was not a, of any sub, like consequence. We caught it early. We're not in production yet or anything like that. So in this case, no harm was done, uh, able to fix it, but the, that's good advice. I can see why. People recommend do that. Now the second thing is um, after filtering you paginate. So this is pretty fairly standard um, code. We've actually reviewed this in a previous session so I'm not going to go over it. I just realized my names were off. I was still using copy pasted code and not, um, you know, you copy and paste sort of to save time and to not have to go through the brain cycles of figuring things out again. Uh, but you just make sure, you know, and as a reminder myself to 
read that pasted code very thoroughly, make sure to understand what is going on. So syntactically it's working, but also semantically it's working. I just didn't check my semantics before. So I had I was calling it memorials even though we're generating archive issues. That's it, refactored the code into a couple of functions so it's easier to follow the get context function and abstracts the details away for easier debugging. Cool, uh, so then that's all for the imperative code. The rest of it is pretty much declarative. Uh, I think there's some changes over here to the model. We'll take a quick look at, but this, uh, what we're looking at now is how I generated this model, this um, menu. This is a pretty cool thing that Wagtail does, lets you do these uh, nested menus here. You could probably go layers deep, but I have never tried that. So what you, basically the two concepts are model admin, which is a page that lets you administer a model this is the model admin page, the way it looks. You have all of the database rows, all of the entities that have been saved from a model, and they're displayed in a table, and you can do things with them, like search them or add a new one or, or filter, you know, by, you know, dates or something. This is not working out. Visual from January. Yeah. By first bullshit. Anyway, I'll come back to that later. That should be working, I don't want to spend too much time in this review session. So here's how you define that. Uh, you have a model admin class that lets you describe one view of, that'll list a bunch of uh, entities and filter them in search. And you have a model admin group that groups those together into a fly out menu more or less. So this is the model admin group right here. And this is the model admin view. So you import your models and you define classes that inherit from model admin. I just by convention will name them the name of the model and then model admin. Yeah, you specify the model for the model admin to render. You can give it a, an icon. I have font awesome icons available. You give it a menu label. You tell it uh, how many per page. You know, it's all declarative stuff. You say what to order it by. We're using our publication date fields in both of these. You tell it what columns to display, you know, title and publication date in this case and you tell it how to let people filter it. So the magazine issues are being filtered at, uh, oh, that's the problem. I'm filtering by the wrong field. I'm filtering by that internal wagtail field when I should be in filtering by this publication date and then things would work properly. So you can see that as an example uh, because I literally just, in my development environment, created these articles today, but I set the publication date for a different, um, a different date because that's what the, um, article lets me select right there. Okay, cool. So no problem. Figured that out. I'll fix that off the stream. <laughs> Very cool. So yeah, let's see. Uh, that's what the filter widget does is gives you that cool uh, drop this select widget. And that's why I wasn't working a moment ago because I'm filtering by the wrong field. It, otherwise, Wagtail, I think is fairly well tested and been very stable in my experience. Uh, if there's no value, you know, there's a bunch of other kind of attributes you could display here. But then you can also let people search for them. So like if I want to search across the collection, it's essentially to help the content ma uh, editor or content manager to do their work effectively. So that's it. Um, then you just group them together and you put the items, the model admin item inside the group. You give it a title and an icon and you tell it where to appear in the menu. I wanted it to be right up top. So I put it 100. Whew, that's cool. All declarative. And this is fairly well documented as well. So I've been really impressed with Wagtail developer experience. Uh, okay, so this is just a slight refactor, renaming things for consistency. Uh, we changed the button text to say clear search. So I just changed the I internal identifiers and method name, uh, function name to reflect that. So small changes. What did we change here in the model? Uh, this is the refactor. So once I discovered that pattern of, again, it's just filter paginate and then attached to the template context. I just wanted to make sure I'm consistent uh, on another code that I'm working with. So this is just a refactor. In the get context method, we have the filter paginate methods and then attaching any additional data to the context at towards the end of the function, returning that context to the template and gets rendered in. Uh, pretty standard um, Django and Wagtail stuff. This get context is basically the equivalent of like rendering a view more or less in Django. It's just attached to a, a Wagtail page class, that's all. 
So yeah, that's been it. Uh, it was a four hour session. I uh, did some cleanup tasks, had some interesting uh, discussions in the chat. It was a good time. And uh, so hope to see more of you in, around in the chat. We're gonna try to get some live, um, some other people involved in the chat. So it's not sort of me having a monologue. Uh, I have a live code extension we've installed in VS Code. So stay tuned for that if you're interested. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, you'll see how it works. So again, this has been a CodeBuddies.org live coding session. If you're interested in uh, Python and Django or React or other languages, but particularly those uh, three, CodeBuddies.org is currently being rewritten. The backend is shaping up to be a Python Django project, although there's a couple of other, um, I think at least one other project underway that is uh, vying to be the official CodeBuddies.org backend. And there's a, a React single page app front end in the works. So if you're wanting to get involved with a open with an open source project and a friendly community at sort of the ground up ground level of the project, uh, stop on by codebuddies.org or check us out on github.com slash codebuddies to get involved. And we'll help you set up a development environment and get started with some low hanging fruit, some easy tasks. All right, well, thanks again for watching and have a great day.